Uh, and the topic, uh, the title of today's sermon is Who's at the Driving Seat? Who's at the Driving Seat? It's a very an antique looking car, which, is, which looks very nice and I would love to drive it. But in your life journey and in your life, when you're traveling, we're all traveling to a destination. Our life is here on this earth, very short. And, but we have an eternal home and we have, a, we have eternity to face. We are on a journey to eternity. Uh, so, in that journey, who is at the driving seat? Who is guiding you? Who is leading? And that's the question I'm asking today. And we're going to pick up from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. And we're going to see how and who is going to lead us through this journey of our life. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 3 reads like this. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. However, you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, speak to each one of us, Lord. So until now, Paul has been speaking about many various things externally, if I may say, in our lives. From the last, since May last, we've been teaching, we've been studying on this First Corinthians and we've been seeing various aspects which Paul is talking about, especially the issues of what is happening in the Corinthian church. There are a lot of issues in that church. Uh, we saw about uh, people getting drunk in church. We saw about head covering and praying. Uh, we talked about uh, building blocks. We talked about the anatomy of Christ. We talked about tortillas, the wrap of life. We talked about you know, many, many situations where how we lead in a church, how in our personal life, whom do we glorify? Uh, whom, who is our Lord? Who is our guiding force? These are all things that we learned in the last few months. And we also saw about waiting on God, being runners for God. These are all things Paul talked about. And now we come to this situation where Paul is shifting his gear to something more spiritual. You might be wondering what we talked about, isn't it not spiritual? It is related to the church, it is related, but now we're talking more specific into the spiritual realm uh, of our lives, in our personal spiritual life, in our personal spiritual walk. And that's what he's going to focus on in the next few uh, chapter, uh, few, one or two chapters. We're going to talk about the love of God, we're going to talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And then we're going to talk about resurrection, the future eternity, our changed, transformed bodies. These are things that Paul is talking about. And then he concludes 1 Corinthians with some travel arrangements and giving and all that. But so in this next few weeks, you're going to see about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, how the Lord is, how the benefits of having the Holy Spirit, the, 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 the blessings that we have having the Holy Spirit with us. So Paul is shifting gear to something spiritual about the Holy Spirit. So coming to verse 1, 1 Corinthians 12, 1, it says, <clears throat> Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers... I do not want you to be uninformed. I do not want you to be uninformed. In this Greek text, when you read the scripture, you will see that the word gifts is not mentioned here. If you looked at any of the exegesis that you have, it says, now concerning spiritual, and says, brethren, I do not want you to be uninformed. The word gifts is not there. But probably translators have added gifts there because the rest of the chapter talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But there's a small problem in that. The problem being, we focus so much on the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we miss out on the fact that it is the Holy Spirit who is giving us His gifts. So when we talk about, when we read the scriptures in the rest of chapter 12, we focus and we, people have a lot of debates and talks about how the gifts uh, operate. And we're going to see that also. But we forget the fact that these are given by the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who gives us his gifts. And he is the one who leads us and guides us. And, and we see the end of the chapter, we see he gives us as he pleases. As the Holy Spirit pleases, he gives us his gifts. So it, we have to remember, it is not the, we, the focus should not be on just the gifts. But our focus should be on the giver of the gifts, which is the Holy Spirit. The, so the better translation of this verse, I think, would be, Brethren, now concerning the spiritual... I don't want you to be ignorant. Don't be ignorant. And he says here, don't be uninformed. He's using two uh, uh, negatives here together. Two negatives. I don't want you to be uninformed. 
When do you do that? Like for example, I can speak to Johnny and say, Johnny, you have to pass in your exams. Or if, you want, if I want to stress it more better, I can say, Johnny, I don't want you to fail in the exams when I'm using two negatives. So I'm stressing a point here, a very important point Paul is talking here about the Holy Spirit and the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives. So it's very important. So Paul is saying now concerning spiritual, about spirituality, about the Holy Spirit, I don't want you to be uninformed. You should not be uninformed. These are certain benefits we have, certain privileges we have because we have the Holy Spirit. Now I know it, um, um, there are many times we forget about certain privileges that we have. For example, just an example, if you have, for example, a medical insurance and you don't use it, how is that? Someone paid or your company or somebody paid for medical insurance, but however, you don't use it or you don't make use of the facilities and it goes a waste and you pay for your, all your hospital, hospital bills. Or for example, another example, you're traveling business class. And you don't realize that you have a facility of using the business class launch. Some You have paid for the facilities that launch. But you don't use it because you were not aware about it. In the same realm here, Paul is talking about there are certain things the Holy Spirit gives us as he pleases. And we need to be aware of that. We, because it's the Holy Spirit who is giving to us. So let us be aware of what's the Holy Spirit giving to us. And in the next few weeks, you're going to see those realms. But today, we're going to focus on the Holy Spirit who is giving us these gifts. Um, so for my concern, don't, let us not be unaware. Let us not be uninformed about this. The Spirit gives us the gifts as He pleases. So verse 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, it says like this. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray, to mute idols, however you were led. When you were before, so the Corinthian church is basically made up of people who were believers of some other deities, some other idols, pagan worship. When you were led, so Paul is saying, you were led at that time. There was a force working behind you at that time. Some kind of spiritual force is working behind you and that spiritual force was leading you to those uh, pagan worship you were led astray so uh, uh, there was an agent there was a spiritual force that was pushing you and leading you to do certain things and that is what Paul is highlighting here there was a force at that time now many times in our lives we are led by different voices different decisions have you ever been led or misled by a friend of yours were you ever misled by a wrong advice given by a friend? Maybe intentionally or unintentionally. I'm sure you have stories about that. How people have led you, you took the wrong move. Maybe some people in your office would have told you that this person is getting more salary than you. Maybe it's a wrong advice, maybe it's a wrong thought, but your mind starts going and thinking about it. And you start being led by those voices, by those thoughts in your mind, right? An angry thought. And you get angry at this person. And you think about how to take revenge. And you focus all your thoughts on this. So there are times in our lives, there were times in our lives that we were led by some kind of external spiritual forces before being believers too. But now we have a different kind of leading. We have a different kind of leadership. We have a different kind of person and that is the Holy Spirit who is going to lead us. Paul himself in his life was led to kill the Christians. His motive, his agenda was to kill Christians. When he was Saul, his aim was to kill the Christians. He was led by that motivation to kill Christians, a wrong motivation. And finally he encountered Jesus on the way, to, on the road to Damascus. And ever since then, he has been, he has been led by a living God who is carrying him and leading him to different places. That is the difference which Paul is highlighting here. You were led before, but now it's different. So, 1 Corinthians 12, 3. In verse 3, when you go to verse 3, 1 Corinthians 12, 3, it says, Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God, or with the Spirit of God, ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. 
No one can say. Before you were led by some other kind of agents. But now you are led by the Holy Spirit who is the comforter. He is leading you now. We have now with us a new GPS. A new GPS. You know, when you have a, when you have a GPS, what does happen? When you put on the GPS to go to a place, global positioning system, right? It locates you where you are and it guides you to the new place. But now we have a new GPS. I would like to call it God's preferred system, not global positioning system. God's preferred system of the Holy Spirit, which leads us and takes us to the, to the place, that, to our destiny, which is the best, which is the place that we need to go. Paul himself has done this. And Paul says, I, when you are led by the Spirit, you cannot curse God. You cannot curse. You cannot say Jesus is a curse. So what is the meaning of this Jesus is a curse? What is the meaning of a curse? A curse something means, it means something that is devoted to a votive offering. That is, you keep a, you keep a, a, a object which is for offering in a particular place or a temple. Or things, you know, that is that is like an object. Or it could also mean an object of curse, something that is cursed. These are two meanings you find about uh, word curse, that is anathema, that is a Greek word of curse. So you cannot say Jesus is curse. Now, how do you say that Jesus is a curse? If you look at the Hebrew word, now let's look at the Hebrew word and get a meaning of it. The Hebrew word is cherem, um, uh, cherem, or it's very similar to the haram which we use in Arabic. And the meaning is very similar to that also. Like we have, when we do certain things wrong, we, we generally say so it's haram. Or when you take certain things, which is not rightfully yours, it's like haram we say here. In the same way, that is the same meaning, cursed. So Jesus, in, in that time, in that society at that time, many people consider Jesus to be a curse. Because if you look at the scriptures also, uh, Jesus became a curse also. Jesus became that curse actually. Yeah. Now this object of being a curse is like we look at the Old Testament and we'll see how to get the meaning of this curse. Joshua chapter 6 verse 17. Joshua chapter 6 verse 17 says like this. This is now in Jericho wall when Joshua talks about Jericho after the, after the defeat of Jericho. And the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. Now this is Joshua telling to the people, when, when Jericho is destroyed, you shall not take anything from Jericho. Nothing belongs to you. It belongs to God. But it says it is a cursed, Bible says it is a cursed thing. At the same time it says that is devoted to God. So you have this meaning of here, which is something devoted to God, yet if you, you, if you take it for your personal things, it becomes a curse upon your life. That's what he's talking about here. So that object, you should not be having anything that is devoted to God or something that is cursed. Or if you, you misuse it, if you take it, it becomes a curse upon your life. That is a word that is used here. In Deuteronomy 7.26, Deuteronomy 7.26 says like this, uh, Nor shall you bring an abomination to your house, lest you be doomed to destruction like it. You shall utterly detest it and utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. You shall not bring any object in your house. Do you have any object that is cursed in your house? There can be objects that it's in your house that can be cursed. I have seen many people, when I, when I, probably when you visited people and things that, sometimes when you enter the house, you immediately, your eyes catch up on certain things and you say, oh, oh, that thing is something, it's something, it's not in the wrong, it's not in the right place. It should not be in here. And sometimes in your lives too, Maybe the Holy Spirit will tell you, this is wrong, you should get, it, get rid of it. There, are, there could be certain objects that can bring a curse in your life, into your home. You should not bring anything like that into your home. That kind of object into your home. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23. Deuteronomy 21, 23. Um, this is what the Bible talks about, a, another curse object. That is, his body, that is the person who dies, shall not remain all night on the tree. But you shall bury him the same day. For a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you for inheritance. And a person hung on a tree is a cursed person. And that is a 
time, at, uh, that was a belief at that time, that anybody hung on a tree is cursed. And we know that this is referring to Jesus who got who was hung on a tree. Um, uh, when we see in Galatians chapter 3 verse 13, Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. So, when Jesus was crucified, now Jesus was a great man, was a good man. He did all miracles, he did all kinds, he, did, he blessed the people, he, he did all good people, all good things he did to the people. But at the end, when he got, cur when he got, when he, uh, got crucified on the cross, Many people considered him as a cursed object. Many people considered him to be a cursed thing. Because he died. Such a good man, how can he buy, die? You know, there is this talk sometimes when things go wrong in certain families or certain situations, you kind of feel, okay, there's some curse in your life, right? Or maybe that person is cursed or maybe that family is cursed. So people talk about all this. In the similar way, when Jesus was crucified on the cross, people considered him as a cursed thing. And yes, he was cursed. He became cursed. He became cursed so that he can redeem us from the curse. And that's a blessing that we have. That's the good news that we have. That, that cursed object which people detested having to have in their homes or that cursed object which you should not be touching it or bringing it, he became that cursed object or he became an object where even God's wrath and curse fell upon him. It was so bad that even God the Father refused to take Jesus. And God the Father also kept out. And that's why Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The curse, he became that cursed object. And praise God because he became that cursed object just for us. That is the great part. That is the good news that we have today because he became that curse for us. So the next time the law says that you should be failing, praise God because Jesus took away the curse. The next time somebody says you should be sick or you should not be getting this, let me tell you, Jesus has taken the curse from our lives. That is a blessing that we have. The curse, the intimidation, the fear, the sickness, the anything, death, um, all kinds of destruction that could have happened to us. Praise God because He has taken it from our lives. He has removed it from our lives. The curse, He has re Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by, by becoming a curse for us, by hanging on the tree, by being crucified on wood, on a cross. It is, it is a shameful thing to keep a cross in, our, in, in homes actually. It was a cursed thing, but Jesus redeemed us, taken us out from that curse. Hallelujah. Praise God for that. This is such a beautiful news because Satan has no more right over our lives. Satan has no more right over our lives. He's taken, he's taken everything. Christ has washed away every kind of curse. If Satan could have blamed you for anything, Jesus Christ, no, I am taking that blame. So verse 3 says, 1 Corinthians 12, 3 says, Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. If you are in the, with the Spirit of God, you can never say that Jesus is a curse. He is not accursed. He became a curse so that we can be set free. He became. He was not the curse. He took upon it himself so that we can be redeemed. We can be set free. And then it says, you, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And if, if it is not with the Holy Spirit, you cannot say this. So who is the driving force now? Who is with us now? Who is driving us to proclaim that Jesus is Lord? Who is the one in our hearts telling us that Jesus is Lord? That driving force in us is the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul is saying here. You cannot say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you might be thinking, maybe I'm not led by the Holy Spirit. I don't hear any special kind of sound from heaven. I don't even hear a whisper. You know, I don't see dreams even. You might be coming, how does the Holy Spirit speak? Well, let me tell you, if you can say Jesus is Lord, Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. If you can just say that, let me tell you, you it is the Holy Spirit who is telling you, 
or who is convincing you in your heart that Jesus is really the Lord. So you should have the confirmation in your heart, yes, I have the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is speaking to me. The Holy Spirit is confirming to me that Jesus is Lord. So otherwise we cannot say Jesus is Lord. Before you were led with some other kind of spirit, some other kind of force. Even now, sometimes when we get angry, we get led by anger, right? We are led by anger to do horrible things. But let not that happen. Let the Holy Spirit be the leader who is leading in our lives. 1 John chapter 4 verses 1 to 3. 1 John chapter 4 verses 1 to 3 says like this. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone into this world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that go, do, does not confess Jesus is not from God. That is the spirit of Antichrist which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Okay, so that is a, this is a, the, Paul is, John is telling here, test every kind of spirit. People come with different kinds of spirits, but test and see which is a right spirit. So this is, the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts you, who, who leads you. By the Spirit, verse 2, verse 2 says, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. So it is the Holy Spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. He is a he is a authenticator of the fact that God became flesh and is residing in man. Romans ten nine says, because if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Again, the confession, our confession, what we confess with our mouth, that is what brings salvation. In our lives, this confession, confession, and that is this confession is confirmed by the Holy Spirit. Nobody else confirms it to us. It is the Holy Spirit. So sometimes when doubt comes in our hearts, just remove the doubts, because a lot of voices will come to your mind and tell you many things. You know, sometimes when you have some kind of sickness, as a cough or cold or a headache, a lot of voices will tell you many things. Not just the voices, even internet and Google says a lot of things. But let me tell you, if you, if you close off all those voices and listen to the Holy Spirit who is there in us, He will confirm healing to you. He will confirm prosperity unto you. He will guide you. He will tell you what to do and how to deal with certain situations. That is what we have in the Holy Spirit. And so what does the Holy Spirit do in our lives? The Holy Spirit does a lot of things and I want to pick up a few verses of how the Holy Spirit blesses us and gives us. This is just about the Holy Spirit that is in spite, in, other than the gifts of the Holy Spirit. This is how, the, who the convicts us of certain wrong things that we did? Who convicts us of certain wrong things that we did? It's the Holy Spirit. Turn to John chapter 16 verses 7 to 8. John chapter 16, 7 and 8. It says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, and when he comes, who is this? The helper, the comforter. When he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So what does the Holy Spirit do? He convicts us of our sins. Sometimes when we go wrong, when we do some sin, he will convict us. That was wrong, buddy. That was wrong. What you did was wrong. Have you ever done certain situation and a red flag came in your mind? And said, oh, oh, I think I shouldn't have said that. Right? Or maybe in your anger, you've spoken some things. And immediately after the words have come out of your mouth, a red flag goes up in your mind saying, something went wrong. That wasn't right. I shouldn't have said that. Or maybe you went to some wrong websites. I shouldn't have said that. Or I shouldn't have gone there. That is the Holy Spirit raising a flag in your mind, in your lives, saying, this is wrong. What you did is wrong. And then the Holy Spirit also convicts you of your righteousness, of your right standing with God. That's Even that the Holy Spirit convicts you. Even if you go wrong, if you do wrong, the Holy Spirit convicts you. But the Holy Spirit also reminds you of your righteousness and of where you are destined. That's also what the Holy Spirit reminds you. 
So who convicts you of your sin, of something good? So in everyday walk of life, maybe maybe you cross the red light or maybe you did something wrong in the office. The Holy Spirit raises a flag. Don't quench the Holy Spirit at that time. There are, um, uh, there are some people I've heard, many people have said this, you know, in tough situations, tough fight at the office or something goes wrong and, they, and you have said this, you know what, if I was my old self, I would have told him something now. Or if I was not a believer, I could have done and played these games to work in my favor. Am I right? You've said that, right? Or, uh, you know, uh, somebody, um, somebody runs again, run, uh, drives against you or makes you, makes you uh, suddenly stop the car or gets on your way and you, and, and, and you are about to call them names. All kinds of names, all kinds of words. But then something stops you from doing that. And that's the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit guides you into this. Holy Spirit raises the flag. Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin and of your righteousness. What does the Holy Spirit teach you? What does the Holy Spirit teach you? The Holy Spirit teaches you about Jesus. Who, who, who is the one revealing to you about Jesus? About the Son of God? It's the Holy Spirit. John 16 verses 13 to 15. John 16, 13 to 15. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will, he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Look at that. Look at what the Holy Spirit is doing. The, what the Holy Spirit, he is going to take everything what is Jesus and give it to you and show it to you, reveal it to you. Whatever Jesus did, he is the one who is going to reveal it to you. Anything what the Father has, has given, he has given it to his son Jesus. And whatever Jesus has, the Holy Spirit is the one going to give it to us. We are going to learn more about Jesus through the Holy Spirit. If you learn something new about Jesus, a new revelation of Jesus, it is through the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that is yours, that benefit that, that God has given so that, so that you will be blessed, so that you can know about Jesus. And if you know about Jesus, that's the greatest victory that we have, the greatest salvation that we have, that the greatest, um, you don't need anything more than this if you have Jesus. That's all you need. Jesus, the revelation of Jesus by the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you, what else, what else the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sins. The Holy Spirit reveals us about Jesus and the Holy Spirit lives in us. The Holy Spirit lives in us. John 14, 16 to 17. The Holy Spirit lives in us. And I will ask the Father and He'll give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. You know Him for He dwells, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So that's a confirmation that, uh, that Jesus is saying, you have the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is going to live in you. You're not alone, guys. None of you are alone. You have the Holy Spirit lives in us, who lives with us. Isn't that such a great opportunity? Such a great blessing. You were supposed to be cursed. You were supposed to be doomed. You were supposed to be uh, destined for, 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 for death. But today, because of Jesus, because of the Holy Spirit, he guides you, he, uh, who, who, who leads us, he convicts us of our sin, who confirms our salvation to us and who reveals Jesus un, unto us. He lives in us. He lives in us. So we are not led as before. We were led by anger or sin or some kind of evil spirit or some kind of evil forces before. You were led. But now because you are a believer, you believe in Jesus Christ, you believe in the, and the Holy Spirit is in you, you are led by an entirely a new kind of force. And this force is not dumb. He speaks to you. He reveals Jesus. He convicts you of your sin. He lives inside of you. Isn't that great? That's the Holy Spirit that we have. That's the Holy Spirit that we have. And Paul is saying, you cannot say Jesus Christ is Lord if you didn't have this Holy Spirit, if you didn't have the Spirit of God. As long as you can say Jesus Christ became flesh 
and lived in this world and he is our Lord and Savior, you have the Holy Spirit in us. And this Holy Spirit gives us many advantages, many things. Just the fact that when you did something wrong, a flag goes up in your mind or in your heart saying this, this I did is wrong. If that happened to you, let me tell you, the Holy Spirit is working in you. And if you listen to that voice again, if you look, listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, it's a prompt, it's a nudge, it's a small voice. The more you listen to it, let me tell you, it will become clearer and clearer. You will know how to lead, you will know how to do way, walk way of life, you will know how to live. And I want to read a few encouraging thoughts which Paul shares in the book of Ephesians to the Ephesians church. It's very interesting how the Holy Spirit leads us. And when you go through this, you will know that, yes, I'm going through this in our day-to-day life. And I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation Scriptures, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 to 32. And listen carefully. As I read it, listen carefully. Verse 25. So, stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And do not sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. Do not use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be encouragement to those who hear you. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way of life. Remember, He has identified you as His own guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Verse 32, Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. Does that speak our life? Don't speak lies. Don't speak foul language. Let the Holy Spirit live in us and guide us through this. He is the leading force. He is the guide behind the wheels. He is the one who is going to lead us to, uh, to the destination. So let us not grieve the Holy Spirit. Let us not put Him down. Let us not, let us not subdue that inner voice or that confirmation that we have in our hearts of what is right and wrong. It comes up, it pops up in our hearts, it flags, it gives us a red flag or a green flag. There are different ways the Holy Spirit guides us. And we're going to see it in the weeks to come. But let us not put that down. Let us not uh, you know, think that, nah, no, this must be just my thought. No, it is in our thought process that the Holy Spirit works. It is in our thought process that the evil spirit works too. The devil comes and fights in our minds, in our thoughts. The mind is the battlefield, yes. So the Holy Spirit also speaks in our thoughts. So don't just negate it by saying, oh, just as thoughts. No, it is the Holy Spirit speaking to you and guiding you. Let us live a good life so that others will understand who the God is, who is the Holy Spirit. Uh, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, and we'll close with this. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witness telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This is the Holy Spirit who is going to give us the power. He will give us the power to lead us and to speak to others about Christ. And this is very important. How can you be a witness of Christ to others? It is the Holy Spirit that is going to guide us and lead us to that. You will be getting a prompt. You will be getting a nudge. You will be getting a signal on how to do this. And that signal comes from the Holy Spirit. Don't lose that opportunity. Don't waste that opportunity. Let us use it. So I want to ask you, who is in the driving seat? Who is in the driving seat in your life? Who is in the driving seat in your life? Is it the Holy Spirit? Is it any kind of spirit? Was it, the, was it the dumb spirit that led you before? Is it anger? Is it um, uh, some kind of lust? Is that driving you? But let me ask you, let me, let's think for ourselves and let the Holy Spirit teach us and guide us 
and confirm to us today that it is He who is in the driving seat. And let me tell you one thing. It is the Holy Spirit guiding you. The Holy Spirit is not going to steer the wheel. The Holy Spirit will not steer the wheel for you. He is like the new GPS will guide you. The Holy Spirit is a new GPS. Okay, He is only going to guide you. He is not going to turn the wheel for you. You have to turn the wheel. So who is behind the wheel now? We are behind the wheel. But we are behind the wheel and the Holy Spirit is guiding us and leading us in the direction we need to go. So don't sit around and say, I have nothing to do. No. You have to turn the wheel. You have to put it on gear. You have to start the engine. You have to make a move. Press the accelerator. Brake when it has to be, when you have to stop, brake. There may be speed breakers in our life and we have to stop. And the Holy Spirit is going to guide and say, take left, take right. He's going to guide you. And even if you make a wrong move, let me tell you, it's going to recalculate and He's going to guide you. The Holy Spirit will recalculate and take us to your destination if we allow Him to do it. So Paul is telling here, it is only by the Holy Spirit you can say Jesus is Lord. If you can say Jesus is Lord, Paul is telling, you have the Holy Spirit. You are being led by the Holy Spirit. There's nothing to worry about it. In the weeks to come, you're going to see about how in different ways the Holy Spirit is going to lead us and to guide us. This is a privilege that we have. It's a benefit that we have because with the Holy Spirit, He knows everything. He knows everything that's happening around us and He will guide us to take the right step. But you have to take the right step. You are behind the wheel. You are behind the wheel. You need to take the move. You need to press the accelerator and move forward under the guidance of the Holy Spirit who lives in us and who is guiding us. So let us stop stealing. Let us stop using abusive language. Let us not, contr- let us not drive the car in anger. Don't put on the gear in anger. No, stop. You need to pause. And you need to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. All right? So shall we close in prayer? Shall we close in prayer? Father, we want to thank you for this great time you've given us. We bless you. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that you've given us. And thank you, Lord, for this guidance, this new GPS that you have given us, that we will be able to reach our destination and we'll be able to do what you want us to do in this world. Thank you, Father. Thank you for this great opportunity you've given us. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the communion, Lord. Thank you we could take part in your body and your blood, which is another physical confirmation of who we are in Christ. And that confirmation, which is the confirmation given by the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, so much. Thank you, Father, for giving us your Holy Spirit who lives in us and who will guide us. Holy Spirit, in weeks to come, teach us more about you. And we want to listen to your voice more. It's a very subtle voice, I know. Yes, it's a still, but it's a firm voice. And we want to listen to it more. Teach us, Lord. And thank you for this great time. Thank you for being with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.